I said it in an earlier video, and I'll say it again. In my opinion, there are few countries with physical geography as remarkable as Peru's. And I have more I want to share that wasn't in the first Peru video I made. But this time, I'm going to put a little more emphasis on how its inhabitants have adapted to its physical geography. I'll start with Peru's desert coast. The best way to describe this desert is, of course, dry. Extremely dry. The southern portion of the coast is part of the Atacama, the driest in the world. Lima, Peru's capital and most populated city, is the second driest capital city in the world. But it could also be described as wet. This sounds a little crazy, but let me explain. A desert is defined by how much precipitation it receives, not by the water going in, through, or covering it. Numerous rivers coming from the Andes Mountains flow through the desert. The Rimac River is where Lima gets most of its fresh water. The Supe River was home to the first civilization in all of the Americas. The Carao Supe civilization, which thrived due to successful irrigation using the water from this river, lasted from around 3500 to 1800 BCE. But the craziest thing about this desert, which I think really earns it the adjective wet, you'll have to wait just one more minute for, because first, I want to share with you today's sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist is a book summarizing service that helps you understand powerful ideas in 15 minutes. They currently have over 5,000 nonfiction books in 27 categories. In their library, they have many great reads. They have books by British journalist Tim Marshall, who has written several books relating to geography, as well as the award-winning author and geographer Jared Diamond. My favorite book by Diamond on Blinkist is Collapse. Collapse explains the reasons behind the disintegration of once mighty civilizations like the Mayans in Central America or the Vikings in Greenland. Their stories provide us with harsh lessons on the possible consequences of our own environmental and societal mismanagement. This book is perfect for anyone interested in environmental issues as well as ancient civilizations. And you can learn about these topics in just 15 minutes. And you can do this risk-free because they currently have a special offer for this channel's viewers. If you sign up using the link I've left in this video's description, you'll receive a free 7-day trial and 25% off a premium membership. Now back to that wet desert. So the rivers flowing across the desert have obviously enabled people to make it their home, and many civilizations throughout history thrive. If we zoom in, we can see farms line their banks, just as they would have hundreds and even thousands of years ago. But this is the craziest part. A reason for the coastal aridity is the Humboldt Current, also known as the Peru Current. Air moving north is cooled by the cold water current, conditions that result in low precipitation. But at the same time, it generates fog. Now it doesn't look like this all year round, but these are real pictures of Peru's desert when and where the fog is heaviest. In parts of the desert, vegetation will spring up from June to October when the fog is heaviest, and the landscape will be mostly barren the rest of the year. And some communities in Peru are using an innovative practice in order to utilize this fresh water. They are using nets to capture the micro droplets suspended in the air, which then run down into a tank. One fog catcher captures 50 to 100 gallons of water a day. Currently, 20,000 to 30,000 people around Peru are using this practice. The inhabitants of the land of what is today Peru have a history of innovative environmental adaptations. The Inca civilization was an empire home to over 10 million people at its peak in the 1520s, and was centered on the city of Cusco. At its peak, it covered this entire area in South America, and was the largest empire in the world by size when the Spanish arrived. Because of the region's challenging geography, in order to survive, let alone thrive, innovative adaptations were a necessity. We've already established that the empire's coast was mostly a low-lying desert, but further inland is mountainous and high in elevation. Not an ideal environment for extensive agriculture, but the Inca and groups that lived in this area before them adapted. They were hydraulic engineering experts. Not only did they develop irrigation that tapped into rivers flowing from the Andes Mountains into the Pacific Ocean, but they also created aqueducts and reservoirs throughout the empire. But there is one environmental adaptation that best defines this great civilization, and that is terrace farming. The mountainous terrain throughout the empire was too steep to grow crops, water can't be harnessed, and the soil erodes easily on slopes. So the Inca built terraces throughout the Andes Mountains. Along with preventing erosion, these terraces made water use more efficient. 
Terraces also help to insulate the roots of plants during cold nights and hold in the moisture of the soil, keeping plants growing and producing longer in high altitudes. This was extremely important considering two-thirds of the empire lived above 3,000 meters. The Inca cultivated around 70 different crops, but the potato may have been the most important. This native crop could be grown at a variety of elevations, making it a staple food in the mountainous empire. The Inca were so well adapted that they typically had large surpluses and would store extra food in colcas, which allowed for the survival of food supplies in the cold climate of the Andes, and they could be tapped into in times of crop failure, such as drought. These colcas had drainage canals, gravel flooring, and ventilation in both the floor and roof in order to keep the interior as cool and dry as possible, so the goods could be stored for up to two years and freeze-dried foodstuffs for up to four years. It is often said that no one went hungry in the Inca Empire. They also adapted to these high altitudes by creating warm clothing. Their clothing was made up of wool from alpacas and llamas, both native to the Andes Mountains. The dung from these animals were also used as fertilizer. The mountainous terrain should have been a large obstacle for anyone attempting to create and maintain an empire. Tough and diverse terrains can isolate populations, which facilitates the development of unique and separate cultures, making unity extremely tough. This development of unique populations of course did occur, but the Inca held the empire together with a network of nearly 25,000 miles of sophisticated roads. These roads were carefully planned, engineered, built, marked, and maintained. Drainage systems were built to prevent damage, stairs were placed in areas with rising elevations, and suspension ropes were built across rivers. It was based on two north-south roads, one along the coast and the second and most important further inland and up and down the mountains. Both roads had numerous branches. If you want to see past civilization's relationship with the geography firsthand, you can visit Quechua Rope Bridge one of the only remaining examples of the Incan hand-woven bridges, once common in the Incan road system. Morai, huge stone depressions which may have been used by the Inca to experiment with different crops at different elevations and soil types. The salt pans of Maras, fed by a small local stream, the field of interlocking pools has been providing local inhabitants with salt since at least the 1400s. The Pukios, an old and extensive system of subterranean aqueducts, surface channels, reservoirs, and spiraling holes that allowed the Nazca civilization to distribute water. And Cumbaymayo, a 3,500-year-old aqueduct cut out of volcanic rock, which snakes down hills and valleys and sits as high as 1,100 feet above sea level. Before I end this video, don't forget, if you sign up on Blinkist using the link I've left in this video's description, you'll receive a free 7-day trial and 25% off a premium membership. If you missed the first video I made on Peru's geography, you can click and watch that video here. Shout out to all my Patreon and YouTube members for supporting the channel, and thank you all for watching.